So today I'll be finally looking at this Asus Tough Dash F15 laptop, which is a brand new thin and light gaming laptop that focuses mainly on the price. Now the model that I have right here comes with a lower power RTX 3070 GPU and Intel's latest and greatest Tiger Lake CPU, the i7-11370H, that has a grand total of four cores. Now, they are faster cores, but it still feels a bit outdated when you compare it to AMD's new 8-core options. Anyway, it also comes with a 240Hz IPS display, 16GB of RAM and a 1TB SSD. So, the basic configuration should cost you around $1100, while the one I have right here should be around $1500 or €1700, Euros, which still makes it one of the cheapest 3070 laptops in this generation. But is that enough of a reason to go for this laptop? Let's check it out. This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime Series power supplies. These top quality power supplies are very efficient, they're whisper quiet, extremely reliable and my go-to choice for most of my test rigs and builds around here. And to make the deal even sweeter, Seasonic wraps it all up in a cozy 12-year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. Now compared to the last year's model, the new Tough did get a nice visual overhaul. It is thinner, it is lighter, it is built better and it has a nice aluminum top cover which makes it not just more portable but it also looks cleaner and more attractive as well. And most importantly, it doesn't have a tram stamp anymore. Now I have a grey version here but there will be a white one available as well that I would say also looks very good. The chassis has a lot of similarities with the Zephyrus G15 from last year with a slightly different top cover. And since those higher-end Zephyrus laptops had a really nice chassis to begin with, I kind of do agree with their choice to just reuse it. On the right side of the laptop there are two 5 gigabit USB type A ports, there are no connections on the back and on the left side there is a power connection, Ethernet, HDMI 2.0, a single 5 gigabit USB type A port, a Thunderbolt 4 port and a 3.5 millimeter jack. Now this Thunderbolt type C port is actually very interesting as it does allow you to just use different display options as well as faster external storage, but you can also use it to charge the laptop with any type C charger. That is not going to be really enough power for gaming, but it means that you can go and do some work or do your school things with a small compact charger instead of the standard 200 watt charger. You can open it easily with one hand and the inside also kind of reminds me of the Zephyrus. Uh, it is pretty sturdy even though it is mostly plastic with very little flex in the chassis. The keyboard feels as good as their higher end models. Uh, it feels snappy and tactile with a nice amount of travel for a reasonably thin laptop and it is just, you know, very easy to get used to. Higher end models usually have an RGB keyboard while the tough one only comes with a single color backlight. As you can see there is no numpad which is pretty much the norm these days, but unlike the other ASUS laptops that have a numpad feature built into the touchpad, this one doesn't have that so make sure you don't need a numpad at all. As for the touchpad itself, uh, it is the same as usual. It is pretty smooth and it works just fine, but it's still a touchpad. You can use it if you need to, but I you know, personally warmly recommend to use a mouse instead. This laptop also doesn't have a webcam and no webcam means that you get smaller bezels. Uh, many people also don't like them for privacy reasons and many would rather use a smartphone as a webcam as it does offer a better image quality. And while all those things are definitely valid reasons, the reality is that many people simply need a webcam these days and I personally think that they should have included one in this laptop. But let's talk about this display here. Now this version has a 240Hz 1080p IPS panel. Now these panels were actually used on their higher end gaming laptops from last year, which is actually great news for gamers because these are actually very, very nice panels. They feel nice and fast in lighter games that do run high frame rates and they look very smooth in AAA titles thanks to adaptive sync. They also offer nice colors as well, so it is just a good panel overall. I measured 94% sRGB color gamut, which isn't exactly 100% that ASUS is claiming, but it is close enough for actual creative work. 
The color accuracy is excellent as well with near perfect colors out of the box and a similarly good white point. So the factory calibration here is very good as well. Contrast is fine but not exceptional at just over 1000 to 1 and the same can be said for the maximum brightness. 315 is enough for indoor use but it is not that great for bright outside areas. Now do keep in mind that this laptop will be sold with a lot of different panels. Uh, you can also get this laptop with a 165Hz Quad HD screen that they use on the Strix G15, which is even nicer. And cheaper tough models, on the other hand, will be sold with a 144Hz or even 60Hz panel that aren't just slower, but also offer much worse color performance. And I'm actually really happy that ASUS is not hiding that from their spec sheet, so you can actually go there and just make your decision based on your budget and on your preferences. But let's talk about the CPU in this laptop. Now this Intel Core i7 11370H is a bit of a complicated one. Now usually the H behind the name means it's a high-end, high-power processor, but as the real high-end mobile chips aren't ready just yet, Intel decided to launch the slightly higher power version of the mobile CPUs we've seen in thin and light laptops. And as a result of all that, we get this 35 watt, four core, eight thread CPU that definitely doesn't sound as exciting as AMD's latest Zen 3 chips. But you know, let's start with the good stuff here. Single core performance is actually really good. It is either slightly ahead or slightly behind the 5900HX from AMD, depending on what you're looking at and it is comfortably ahead of anything from the last few years. Multicore performance, as expected, is nowhere near the new Ryzen's, and given that both are 35W chips, AMD just has such a huge advantage here. That being said, this i7 is the fastest 4-core in my charts by far, and it even competes with some of the 6-core laptops from the last two years. So, even though AMD will be much, much stronger here, this processor won't be slow in everyday tasks and it will be completely fine for some photo or light video editing as well, especially if you work in Adobe. So I would say it's not a terrible CPU, but it's also very, very important to know its limitations. But this is a gaming laptop after all, and the most important thing would be the gaming performance, right? Now, Things kind of get even more complicated here, at, as you would expect. Now, in my Strix G15 review and the follow-up video, I kind of talked about how difficult it was for the GPU to just show its real power because of several things going on, and it was performing pretty much as last generation of gaming laptops. And then this F15 uses a much lower power 80 watt version of the 3070, combined with a weaker processor, it also uses Optimus that cannot be disabled, and it does all that in a thinner chassis. So in games, it is just not managing to pull ahead of the RTX 2070 or the 2080 Max-Q laptops from previous generations. So if you compare it to the 2019 Strix Scar, a laptop with a higher power 9th gen 6 core i7 and 115 watt RTX 2070, the tough dash is roughly as fast on average it's winning some games but losing some others. Now, on their own, these numbers are gonna be objectively fine and you can play every game at high settings, but I don't think most of you will get hyped hearing that in games, this laptop is just about the same as a slightly more expensive laptop from two years ago. Now, if I compare it to the new generation of laptops I tested so far, things get even more underwhelming. Now, it is behind all of them in most games, and even though some of them are a bit more expensive, it is on average 10% behind the budget MSI GF65 Thin that has an RTX 3060. And if you take the Aorus 15P, for example, with a higher power 3070, you will gain about 33% more FPS on average, and it will only cost you a bit more. Now, since this is a laptop that uses NVIDIA Optimus, you will be able to gain about 10% more FPS if you connect it to an external monitor via the USB Type-C connection on the side, but even that, it's not gonna be enough to catch up. But when it comes to thermal performance, uh, this laptop does very well. In the default performance mode, the, the CPU balances at around 80 degrees Celsius, the GPU hits 78, and the noise levels stay very reasonable at just under 47 decibels. 
In turbo mode, the CPU does get pushed a little bit harder, but it still stays comfortable at 84 degrees. The GPU gets pushed a little bit further too, and while it gets a little bit louder, the difference is actually not that big. Now, this turbo mode will give you roughly 1-2% performance increase in most games, or a similarly small performance increase in CPU tasks, so in reality, you won't even really notice the difference between these two modes. Now, the silent profile, as usual, does make a big difference here, uh, really dropping the GPU power and clock speeds, and it even stops the fans most of the time. So you get a really super quiet laptop when you're working, for example. Uh, I would just say don't expect to play AAA games in silent mode because it will hurt the performance. It is very easy to open up this laptop and clean the fans or replace the battery. Uh, you can replace the SSD or simply add a second one if you need to. And if Wi-Fi 6 ever becomes obsolete at some point, you can even replace that too. Now, the only downside here is that half of the memory is soldered onto the motherboard. Now, for a laptop of this form factor, that is not too bad. I would say, especially since most versions will ship with a dual channel 16 GB 3200 MHz kit by default, but I still think having an option to replace it is always better. Now, although it is only a 76 watt hour battery, the battery life is actually one of the highlights of this laptop. In PC Mark 8, which does use the Nvidia GPU by default, you do run out of battery at a similar pace as last generations. But while watching Netflix, which only needs the internal graphics, you get pretty close to 10 hours, putting it almost at the top of the chart. The 1TB SSD is completely fine as well, and the same can be said for the speakers. I just do wish that they could go a bit louder. If you're looking for some reliable and fast external storage, SSDs are the way to go. It doesn't matter if you're just going to use them to copy some files, to work from them, for example, or to keep your games on. They're just such a useful tool to have. So to recap, I have to say that this is a pretty complicated laptop. On one hand, it's just really nice to use it because it has a really nice sturdy chassis, it has great thermals, it has a nice keyboard and a really nice display and a fantastic battery life. So in that way, it does offer a pretty good user experience. But when it comes to performance, it is just so underwhelming in every way. I mean, you will still be able to play all the games on high settings, but it is behind all of the laptops of the current generation I've tested so far, and it is just about competing with the previous generation ones. And even though it has fast cores, quad-core CPUs are just outdated. So it basically comes down to two things. First thing is that you need to decide what you prefer more the frame rates or the overall experience. Now, most affordable laptops lean towards the frame rates, but the build quality and the panel are usually poor, while this one focuses a bit more on that, you know, overall package. And the second thing is the price. Now, given the poor performance, ASUS really needs to make sure that this Dash F15 is really aggressively priced, because if it's not, I just don't see a reason to go for it. But if they do make it much cheaper than the alternatives with the AMD CPUs, with higher power graphics cards, with MUX switches and all those last year's deals, it might be worth taking a look. Now, I really hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, please give me a like and subscribe to Tech Testers to never miss a video. See you in the next one. Bye.